temas eh, ambientales y agronómicos eh, y es muy interesante el sistema eh, que se han dado eh, en Holanda para justamente lo, implementar los procesos de restauración eh, las agencias que tienen que ver con la gestión del agua tienen, eh, continuamente reciben nuevas alternativas, eh, nuevas herramientas y tienen una serie de mecanismos con la Universidad de Wageningen y con otros centros de testear y analizar esas alternativas. Aprovechando toda esa experiencia, ya que uno de los grupos que más se consulta es justamente el que trabaja Mike, Michael, vamos a eh, exponer una, una serie de eh, estrategias de rehabilitación que, el grupo, que Michael y su grupo han tenido la, la oportunidad de testear tanto a nivel de, de laboratorio como a nivel de ecosistemas eh, completos, ¿no? a nivel natural. Así que muchas gracias, thank you very much, eh, Michael, for eh, accept the invitation, eh, particularly at this uh, eh, period of the year that is so complicated, and it's a pleasure that you have the chance to give a lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, muchas gracias, Nestor, for organizing and for inviting, and also for you to join up, I hope. Okay. Can you hear me? Is it okay? Yeah. Good, because I will be needing your help. This uh, presentation will be on managing, I'll point there, managing eutrophication and controlling cyanobacterial blues. And uh, I also thank Paula for her fantastic introduction into cyanobacteria, into the ecophysiology of cyanobacteria, which makes my talk a lot more easy. Because I was a bit worried when I heard that there were many people who had a whole diverse background, and I'm usually uh, talking to students and to scientists, so I was a bit afraid of the fantastic lecture of uh, Bala. I think they have all the background, at least know what cyanobacteria are and uh, what blooms are. Well, I'm not sure if you know what blooms are, so that's why I need your help now first, because uh, I'm also puzzled myself a bit about the word bloom. So, um, do you think this green soup, this is a reservoir in Brazil, is this a cyanobacterial bloom? Just raise your hand if you think, yes, see, let it down in the snow. So who thinks this is a bloom? Only a few think this is a bloom? <laughs> oh. oh, don't be shy, yes or no? <laughs> Okay, half, half. Well, yes, this is definitely a bloom. This is a bloom of microcystis. Here's the moxes together. Um, and this one, do you think this is a bloom? Yeah? Well, it's not a bloom of cyanobacteria. This is duckweed, lambda. Yeah. Okay, I have another one, which is an old painting from the Netherlands. What do you think here? It's difficult to see, I can help you a bit. This is uh, in a paper, in a publication by a uh, colleague Hans Pell, and he said, note the surface comes characterizing the lake. And I realize it might be difficult to see, so let's do some polishing here, so maybe, yeah. <laughs> so, this is a painting from uh, uh, Jan van der Goeie, already in the 17th century. So, uh, probably blooms were out there in my country for a long time. And we managed this one very, very elegantly because I know Harlem and Mir, the name of the lake, this lake do, does not exist anymore. It is nowadays our international airport. <laughs> I'm not suggesting you to drain it down to the source. Don't get me wrong, eh? Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, don't get me wrong. This is just a to show the pragmatism of my fellow countrymen to deal with problems. <laughs> okay, another one. Um, is this a bloom? Yes or no? No, eh? no, no, no hands. I can help you. Well, this is the water samples, I think. Very clear. These are the chlorophyll concentrations. Very clear. Um, you all agree with me, but unfortunately our authorities consider this a bloom. They wrote an email in August uh, that they have found a large yellow bacteria bloom. 
So what caused this confusion? They found in the back, if you go back there, so near the plants, they found a little bit of brownish olive green colored material, which was microcystis and oligosperm. So and this sample was delivered in the laboratory and people there thought that it was representative of all the lake. Uh, and so then this lake was flowed down where it was five meters exactly that crystal clear water, but it was flowed down for weak lost income for the owner of so no swimming activities. So what is a bloom is very, very tricky. We, 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 we should think about it. What is a bloom and how we process our samples. And we're parking in my system here. Here you can see one of my colleagues, Frank, taking some of these samples. So we advise the owner of the lake, in case you have some release from the sediment, because that's what's happening, Paula will explain some are viable, and when divers do increase strength, you get a little accumulation, very little. This fits in two buckets, so scoop it off the water, problem solved. Yeah? So the question is, what is it blue? Um, this example, this last example, is something I will no further uh, address in this first presentation because it's a, uh, uh, a process that, which is caused by the positive buoyancy of cyanobacteria. If you have a very low biomass of cyanobacteria in the water, you have a water volume, they can come up to the surface and they can be blown to the lee side of the shore by a wind and get locally a problem. We got here, yeah, this, is, this is physically driven. This is not a big growth of cyanobacteria in the water column. And it needs different management strategies than when it's really fueled from all kinds of, of nutrients. So I will not uh, address this one now. I will focus on another scenario where the water turns green, which is proliferation of cyanobacteria. And this is fueled by nutrients. So you need all nutrients building blocks to build the blue. The target there and the management strategy is different. So, um, this process of enrichment of surface waters this is called eutrophication. This is a scientific term that we use with. And nowadays, this is the most important water quality issue worldwide. So, Laguna de Sos is not unique, unfortunately. Yeah, there's a big consensus about that among scientists. There has also been an interview among scientists a couple of years ago by the former president of the American uh, Society of the Knowledge of Genetics, John Downey, and he asked colleagues all around the world, what do you think is the most important water quality problem? And they said eutrophication is number one. And he also asked, what do you think will remain the most important problem? And they all said it will be eutrophication. So even more than, uh, than invasive species or habitat destruction or climate change, so, eutrophication is, by us, as a general consensus, the most important water quality issue. Also in Europe, where I'm from, uh, eutrophication is the main uh, cause of surface waters failing to meet the European Water Framework Directive demands. There's a legislation, European-wide waters, surface waters should meet certain quality standards. In this graph, different areas of pies, the size of the pie diagram indicates the number of waters that are being reported to Brussels, there. and green, they meet, so they are good quality, and red, they are poor quality, whatever that may mean. And if you have a close look to the European Union, you see all countries they have green and red, except one country, this one here, that's my country, the Netherlands, everything is red. So, not a single water body that we report in Brussels that is in a good quality. Um, there's some other interesting thing in here. This is the number of waters. It's only 724. This is rather low. There's a reason for that. Because we do not report the status of our smaller waters, uh, the rivers, the catchments, less than 10 square kilometers, or all lakes and ponds smaller than 50 hectares. We do not include that, we just forget it. For me as a scientist, this is rather peculiar. Because we know we have 170 million lakes on the planet. We know that 90 million are between 0 0.2 and 1 hectares. We know that 23 million are between 1 and 10 hectares. So, 
if we only focus on these large ones, we leave out 98% of the lakes. And you will say, ah, forget about these small ones, they're not important. Well, they are important. They are important for several reasons, because they have a relatively large uh, land water interface, they are important in biogeographical cycling, and last but not least, most of them are located close to urban settlements. So these are waters people have a lot of uh, contact with. So I'm trying to, to, to get them on the agenda. You should not forget about these small waters as well. People have lots of contact with them. If you look at my country, these waters mostly look like this during the summer. I can fill easily the entire room with pictures I've taken over the last decade of uh, green soup or purple or sort of brown soups in my country. And despite uh, the green people make use of fishing is very popular, it's a child fishing man. We would even start to dance in the green soups. Um, children sort of play with it. Some of them have learned that if you paint yourself with the cyanide bacteria and let it dry up, you'll turn into a smurf or blue. And that's a uh, nothing to be really like to see. Um, people also dive into it and become green and then become blue. It's, uh, it, it, it's not nice, no, of course. But there's no authority dealing with that. If we if we take samples, especially from the search accumulations, you can see we do it here. And if we measure the toxin concentrations in these uh, different uh, sites, um, 20 micrograms per litre used to be the threshold above which the bottom sump is closed. These goes into the 10,000s of micrograms per litre, so these are really toxic uh, events. Uh, and the different colours here uh, represent different variants of the microcystine, as uh, Paula already explained to you, there are almost 100 different variants, these are the most abundant ones, and we measure them because they differ in toxicity. Uh, these ones, uh, although they are much more toxic, about 60 times more toxic than the standard microcystine there are. So the HWO guideline is uh, probably uh, underestimating real risk. And the reason for that is that these are much more, much more rapidly transported inside cells than the other ones. And so the mechanism of toxicity is the same, but the rate at which these go into the cells is much higher, so much more toxic. And that's why we measure that. Um, we have much more of these uh, pictures. Um, this guy is, uh, is trying to do something about the bad smell. It smells like a sewage, it's horrible. People complain, so they start to do things, whatever they can. Um, the people in this house here, well, they bought the house to enjoy summer, but they cannot. And you can see the garden is not used. They cannot have a barbecue in summer. They cannot even sell the house anymore because nobody wants to buy it. Yeah? So the architects, when they designed the neighborhood, they draw a nice blue water. They didn't tell the blue was from Gianna material. So, um, we know that in other countries these symptoms, these green soups, are caused by an over-enrichment of the water with nutrients. And these nutrients, they come from different sources. So if we want to do something about it, we need to do what we call a system analysis. This means we are going to figure out where the nutrients come from, and also what it has been done with the lake. So if you keep on putting in nutrients for many years into a lake, your lake will change. Your submerged plants will vanish, your fish community will change, so it will completely change. Uh, nutrient sources are, for example, can be natural, eh? can be birds coming in. I saw when I go to the cormorants coming together, if you see where they, where they get, where they rest, well, they will do a lot of beautification there, they will just call it trophification. Um, can be leaf litter, can also be agricultural. Unfortunately, worldwide, we are still using more and more fertilizers. It's still on the rise, a lot, also in this country. Um, combined with agricultural activities, we have to deal with uh, erosion. We are not so good in all places of uh, protecting the soils. We are still confronted with uh, process of ministries and of course also worldwide a big issue of urban sewage. Uh, we are not reaching the millennium targets for that, uh, about sanitation. And it, we should really uh, focus on that as well. Also in Uruguay, as I've heard, there are settlements of 
a few thousand people next to the uh, Laguna del Siste without proper uh, wastewater treatment. But these are ongoing sources of pollution into the water. So if you know all these sources, this will help you. Help you in guiding, this will guide you towards your management plan. And that's why diagnosis is so crucial. If you have a yeah, if a, if a doctor hears about your headache, you what he will do some tests on you, and not just through the phone describe some, uh, some painkillers and stuff, because your headache can also be caused by high blood pressure. So you want to have a good diagnosis, so it can be treated properly, I hope. Um, these sources, we call them point sources, when they go directly into the water, Time of pipes, eh? often in this, often in case it's sewage, they just make a pipe, go into the water, and we think the problem is solved. And we have uh, non-point sources. This can be diffused through groundwater. In my country, the groundwater is um, completely saturated with phosphates. Our soils are sat uh, saturated with phosphates. Eh? There's no natural retention anymore. We have runoff and also atmospheric deposition, especially from nitrogen. Where I live, the atmospheric deposition of nitrogen is 80 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. That's a lot. So you should also not forget about that. We know, we know, we have seen a lot of examples, that if we dump nutrients in our waters, they will turn green. Uh, we also know that if we stop dumping in nutrients, our waters, our waters, stay green. And they do not clear up, they do not become blue. So, spending hundreds of millions, well actually billions of euros over the last decades in improving wastewater treatment. The Mr. Netherlands is now ranked second on the world list after Singapore. So we have a fantastic wastewater treatment system, but still our water is green. So why are they green? We try to solve this through uh, uh, doing all kinds of other things, like biomanipulation. Nestor mentioned this already in his introduction. But in a review already uh, some years ago, it was concluded that we had probably more chance of failures than of success. So again, we spent a lot of money getting fish out, introducing piscivorous fish, trying to promote uh, water plants, trying to restore the banks without success. And the reason why our lakes do not clear up is because we forgot about the storage of nutrients in our sediments. So we completely forgot about that. So these these systems have a legacy of phosphate from, the, from years, decades of agricultural inputs stored in sediment. And this is what is fueling nowadays our blues. So if we want to reduce, to mitigate, we first of all, what you need to reduce the external load as far as possible. Right? Otherwise, you will just be mopping with a running tap. It's not a good idea. Um, you should also try, in our days, at least, to reduce inventive fish that you keep on resuspending sediments and uprooting plants. But then, we need to target this in lake nutrients. So, and this is both in the water column as that was in the sediment. And to do so, we come into all kinds of phosphorus and solvents. Things that remove phosphorus in the lake. If you go into the literature, don't try to, to, to read this table, you'll find many, many, many examples of fantastic compounds. Fantastic. Really huge uh, phosphate sorting capacity. Um, but if you want to apply them in the field, you should realize that these, they, these should be cheap, huh? and they should be easy to manufacture and easy to apply. They should also be effective. And, uh, and probably, I hope you also have a relatively full, uh, full scale. And last but not least, they should be safe. And if you then look at this whole entire list of, of compounds, not many, not many remain, unfortunately. Oh God, huge, uh, 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 there are compounds in there with expensive beyond imagination if you put the parties to the lake, so not, not possible. Others have really safety issues, especially if it's waste production industry. So that's why, um, 
we decided to focus only on a few compounds in our country, those that we thought of the first screening were most promising. And we also realized that we have a lot of blooms. Well, I already explained that those blooms take up nutrients from the water. So our phosphate solvents absorb phosphate. But during a bloom, all phosphate is inside the cells. There's hardly any phosphate in the water. So if we then throw in a phosphate solvent in the water, it will do nothing about the bloom. Well, it would go to the sediment and do something there, but it will not have an effect immediately. And that's why we decided to combine other experiments with a, a, a flocculant, a low dose flocculant, to sink our bloom immediately to the water column. Most of our legs are not so deep, and we want to pick them, as Nestor already explained in his, uh, one of his first slides, to a clear water state with a lot of submerged plants. So we are going for what we call a shock therapy. And uh, you see some tubes here with uh, examples of cyanobacteria. This is Microsis aeruginosa. It's a very common uh, organism uh, all around the world. And it has positive poison. Uh, these are controls, and if we do nothing and wait, all the biomass goes up. You can see this here, it's rather rapid. It's but it means it all goes to the uh, top. Uh, if we add only a flux, we make larger flux. A larger flux of things that have positive points will go to the surface very rapidly. This is something that might be considered in harvesting. Eh? One of the questions about harvesting, there are companies nowadays out there that uh, produce uh, a coagulant of flocculant, which is made by bacteria, and they have these container units, they can process about 50 cubes per minute. They flock them in the unit, inside the unit, and they make cookies out of it. They compress it. So they make this high uh, those who, um, uh, who, uh, who know a bit about wastewater treatment, these are these high-speed filtration bags they use. And it's used to reduce stability in, in, uh, in uh, wastewater treatment as well. So they have impact that in mobile units. So uh, these techniques are now being developed, and this is to harvest. Uh, and, and, but they do this inside, inside the unit. Um, we are uh, working with whole legs and treat them uh, as, as far as possible. And then we want to have the biomass going down. And this is what you see here in the last tube. You combine a low dose flocculant with the ballast, and then these same bacteria will go down to the sediment rapidly. And just the top, just the top, just the bottom. Of course, if you want to implement this in a lake, uh, you have your phosphorus coming from the sediment, fueling a bloom, you have a heavy bloom with low transparency. You combine this, the idea is to get everything down and to catch the sediment with your phosphate and solvent. So nothing will, and you will maintain your clear water. But there are many questions you need to ask yourself. Not a single lake is unique, and so always you need to have a proper diagnosis. And then, how to fluctuate, how to precipitate. What's it is, what are, what are any safety issues, what are the costs, and we do not forget about checks and monitoring, because we need, we need this knowledge. And far too often, what are the authorities just do something, do copy based on measures, forget about monitoring, and then we have no idea whether it has been to say or not. I think this is good uh, for, 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 for them, and so they cannot say to the boss it was a failure that they wasted money, but it's very bad for society in general, so please do not forget about checks and monitoring. Um, there are many flocculants out there, and many P-solvents that can be used for men. For example, aluminium, iron, calcium salts, some waste products, think about safety. Some local soils, local materials, um, some modified clays for flocculants uh, that, go, that make cells clock together. Uh, very common use is alum in the United States, for example, polyaluminium chloride. It's better to use polyaluminium chloride than alum. Alum is hydrolysis in the water with a risk of uh, pH drop. And uh, the, the flocculation process of polyaluminium uh, has already started in the factory, so the pH drop is much less. And you do not bring in sulfate in the water as you will do with alum. Yeah. So there's also something you should be careful with because sulfate, if it goes down to the sediment, it can actually get sulfites. Besides that, it can be toxic to plants. Uh, it can also take away iron and precipitate as periods and that will 
if you pack some phosphate. So, uh, if it comes out of aluminium source, that is preferred to not have iron source that can be used, but be careful with that, because iron is redox sensitive. Uh, there are some, uh, some organic ones. Uh, for flocculated, you only do usually low dose, eh? so the majority of elements that was referred to is used, for, uh, is used here as phosphate and solvent, not as flocculated in, in fuels. But bottom line of all these things is that they need to be thorough tested and also you get a proper dose for your system. And this is, this is what we are doing in my opinion. We test from the laboratory, from microcosm, technologies, to all like applications. We need this. No, we need this entire scale. We need eventually experiments on a whole scale to get really into our things. Because we can never include all factors in our control network experiments. Yeah, it's very difficult to put a fish in these tubes. So, and you can try them. So, so, so we, we need this. Yeah. And uh, I'll give you some examples of some very small scale experiments. Very simple. This is a Fnazomino for Barclay. And this is a, a flocculant with a very little amount of a balanced compound. Well, everything is on top, so this is not enough. And if you add more, you can see it all goes down. So, okay. These are very simple dose range findings, so you know what kind of dose can be used. These are some other tubes, some controls, and some ballast and parts, and some ballast and iron chloride. Already from the color, you can see that at this dose, the iron performs much, much worse than the, than the park. And you can do all kinds of measurements here. You can see where for this is a concentration, gray is in the bottom of the tube, and these are light ones here are in the top, so you can really visualize where the cells are. And this one, the dots, is the photosystem to efficiency, the measure of the happiness of the algae, so they are healthy. And you don't want to kill them, uh, because if you kill them, it will bring all kinds of compounds into the water, including toxins, and we don't want that. For the technician idea, it we fluctuate without change of the set of potential. And the reason for that is that if we change the zeta potential, we will uh, compromise the membrane integrity of the cell material with the potential uh, risk of uh, leaking toxins in the water. So we don't want that. Um, and then you can do all kinds of measurements, eh? all kinds of uh, just uh, on pH, is a pH drop. But most important are these the dissolved uh, persistent concentrations. With this treatment, we even bring down the dissolved one. So it means that by flocking and sinking, because it has a sweeping mechanism, it strips also the water column from part of the dissolved one. It also removes actually uh, back to all the bacteria. But this is largely uh, uh, problems with uh, pathogens as well. So this is just stripping the water column. So we use a low dose magnet, flocculant, and a ballast, and we sink intact cells. That's important for us. Later on, the cells may uh, die, of course, on the sediment. We will be happy with that, because then uh, the chance that they come back is also much, much less. Um, of course, uh, I know that there are also quite some biologists in here. Well, you know, I could already see them thinking about what does it do with other organisms. Is it an effect on zooplankton? Oh, yes, it is. Uh, you can see that the clearance rate of Daphne is reduced with these treatments, and also so far, copperpot it is a bit lower for me fucking out. But don't worry, the systems are quite resilient. If this was the only thing to, uh, to be concerned about, well, that's a okay. um, There are many potential phosphate solvents to be used and ballast compounds, and we need to test them. And here you see some examples. This is our sediment course, taken from uh, Jacare Bagua, in the uh, Rio And uh, this is, yeah, and you see flux being formed, flux go down, you get a capital A on the sediment, and through the activity of the coronavirus or colic eggs, it's mixed in. Mix in. You want that because then it has the most effective uh, effectiveness on the communicating sediment depth. These are different uh, compounds that are being tested. Uh, just off application, gives a nice color to the water. Another example from Brazil is a green soup from your reservoir with a red soil next to it. So we tested the red soil for its phosphate 
sorts of capacity, and it's sold for sale. Of course, the less on the anoxic conditions, because uh, it contains quite some iron, which is uh, reductive label binding, but even an anoxia, it's sold for sale. So instead of manufacturing an expensive clay and having all kinds of transport costs, the possibility in this one could be to use a red soil. Of course, if the reservoir is an open system, so the, the primary goal of the red soil is the ballast, but it can still solve some phosphate. So always keep your eyes open for what might be next at all, because there are possibilities and we need to think about cost as well. Our techniques should be as cheap as possible. And this is especially the case when we are dealing with open systems, which I mean that receive an ongoing load of nutrients and that needs regular maintenance, uh, regular intervention. In, um, in Europe, we uh, uh, were very happy that the compound, which was developed by a certain government in the 90s, by Cyprus CSRO, which is the Australian Governmental Institute, a recent center for environment and life science, then it became available on the market under the brand name Phosphor, so it got commercialized. And uh, given the thorough testing already by CSRO, and also the way it was uh, constructed and, and the chemistry behind it, we decided, well, let's do some more tests on that one because it looks promising enough. We went into the patent just to find out what it is. So what is phosphate? Well, it's a bentonite, it's a clay, it's enriched with lanthanum, atomic number 57. This describes how it's made. A bentonite, just going to go into the details, just clay. The clay usually exists on different layers, and because of the cation and change in the layers, and there's a charge difference, and between the, the package of layers is a space where other cations usually find their place mostly sodium or potassium, but this can be exchanged. That has been done in the process. So what they do, they remove exchangeable cations between layers of clay and substitute them with a lantern. Of course, um, first things we did was just checking this compound for impurities and also about the lantern content. Beware, this is a metal moss fraction, this is a box still, eh? so this is 100%, this is 10, this is 1%, 0.1, etc., all the way down. So we were uh, happy to find some lanthanum, but we did not find 5%, as the manufacturers claim, 4.4 we found. And we were also happy not to find any mercury at all, with low level of uh, detection, and very low, <coughs> very low amounts of. Uh, of impurities, very low, even lower than the uh, uh, so this is good. Um, this low number of lanthanum, or lower than five, was also found by some others, in 2000. So it's 10% less than what the company claims. Eh? So if you buy, uh, they already made some profit, I think. So, so this is uh, something to realize. So how uh, uh, does these uh, Lanthanum work. Well, we know that lanthanum phosphate it precipitates, well, actually, it's an equilibrium, but it's with a very low uh, uh, equilibrium constant. We can see it, say, it's a precipitation. So, this form is rather faint. Most of the time, you will find this equation, which, of course, is chemically very peculiar because lanthanum 3 plus uh, reveals a low pH and phosphate triplum iron only has very high pH. But this is for simplicity. Lanthanum phosphate can also occur as this with monazite, which has even a much lower solubility uh, product. So this is chemically this is very interesting because these these burn bonds are redox insensitive and also uh, very stable uh, to weathering and also to pH changes. You know, this lanthanum has been brought into clay. The idea is that it will bind phosphate and then it will be under sediment and block the release of phosphate from the sediment. Of course, you need to test this. Eh? You, you cannot believe uh, your colleague scientists from Australia and his company on the blue eye, so we felt we need to do the testing. So we test how well do they absorb phosphate. Well, these values, these maximum uh, uh, absorption values, they match very well with what uh, uh, CNRO and others have to take. So it really does absorb uh, phosphate and it absorbs very well also on the anoxic condition.
Sediment cores out of the lake. 